So last month, I made a video about the most famous and most disastrous prison concerts. And as often happens, many of you guys dug up even more wild stories in the comments. In this video, we're going to go through a few more of them. So let's get right down to it. Previously, I argued how there were two main reasons for performing at a prison. There are those who genuinely want to connect with inmates, and there are those who want to do it to boost their careers. Most people fall somewhere in between. What I didn't realize, though, is the third reason. The much more pragmatic goal of playing a concert in order to break somebody out. This famously happened in Spain in 1985, but buckle in, because we're going to need a quick history lesson first. Along the Spanish-French border is an area known as Basque Country. Although it's mostly part of Spain and partially France, it's a unique culture with its own language, traditions, and ethnic heritage. I was surprised to learn that the Basque language is actually completely unique from Spanish. In fact, there's virtually no Latin influence besides loan words. But back to the history. The hypernationalism of the 20th century was not friendly to autonomous people like the Basques. And sure enough, when Francisco Franco came into power, many Basque traditions were banned or subjugated in favor of a single Spanish identity. This, as you can imagine, led to some pushback. And one such group that protested were the Euskadi Ta Ashkadashuna, or ETA for short. This was a Basque separatist group who believed in breaking away from Spain to create their own nation. Within their ranks were some who believed that violence was necessary to achieve that goal. And these more extreme members would carry out bombings, kidnappings, and political assassinations. Hey. One such member was Joseba Sarionandia. He was arrested in 1980 on charges of kidnapping and possessing weapons, and sentenced to several decades in prison. He was also a notable writer, and while locked up, wrote poems about his torture and incarceration. Five years into his sentence, a concert was announced at Mortu Tene Prison, where he was held. The show was being put on by Imano Larzabal, a Basque singer who was also a member of ETA, and had been imprisoned a decade earlier. The authorities must have found this suspicious, because they rejected his request to play two years earlier. However, this time around, for whatever reason, it was approved. And one week later, there he was, setting up gear in the prison's TV room. The show was uneventful. However, after it ended, as Imanol's crew loaded gear down a staircase, Sario Nandia hid inside a PA speaker, while Inyaki Picabea, another ETA member who was locked up, hid inside the other. The speakers were then carried across the courtyard and loaded into the van, where the crew awaited a final inspection. You can only imagine what this must have been like, remaining dead silent as your body is awkwardly twisted around the speakers. But the guards didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so the gates were opened and the van was ushered through. The two inmates had successfully escaped. Sario Nandia would go into hiding for decades, living, he later revealed, in Cuba, where he continued writing books. It wasn't until this year, in April 2021, that the charges had officially been dropped, and Sario Nandia was allowed to return home. As for Imanol and his crew, who allegedly helped in the escape, they turned themselves in the next day and were held in jail while authorities investigated. Once it became clear there wasn't enough evidence to convict them, they were released some months later. The breakout became a sensation in Basque counterculture. The punk band Cortatu immortalized it in their song Sorry Sorry, a cover of the Toots and Maidles song Chatty Chatty. <laughs> 
Considering how ska punk has become something of a meme summer party genre, it's pretty interesting to see its more serious political roots. Of course, this is far from the only Wild Prison concert story to come from outside the English-speaking world. And thanks to you followers, I've learned of a few others that need mentioning. In 1978, the legendary Brazilian counterculture singer Jarges Macale performed at a prison in Brasilia. Just a few days earlier, he himself had been arrested for playing a song that wasn't approved by the censors. This was, mind you, in the midst of Brazil's military dictatorship. What he had done was seen a parody song about the politician Magalhães Pinto. Apparently, in Portuguese, Pinto is slain for dick. And while unfortunately I could not get a recording to save my life, we do know the song's opening lines. This was enough to get him arrested by the federal police. Fortunately, he was released from custody shortly after, and a sympathetic prison director in Brasilia invited him to come perform. The fact that he was now in front of inmates singing rather than sitting among them was indeed a powerful message. The soundboard recording from that day sat unreleased for 40 years and just recently saw the light of day. Next, if you remember my history of Soviet punk videos, you might recall the band Auction. They were among the first generation of punk bands to emerge from the also not so music friendly Soviet Union. In 1987, just a year or so after rock music was broadly legalized, they gave a performance at Yablonivka prison. The show was actually filmed and stands out for a couple reasons. Those stoic inmates in their drab gray uniforms, the terrifying no-frills stage with auctions experimental array of instruments. The show was organized by a former inmate who served a six-year sentence for pornography, having photographed nude ballet dancers. However, the rest of the inmates, by and large, were not fans. They perceived us as degenerates, the band later said in an interview. There was such infantile freedom in our faces back then. I think this was unpleasant for them. We even had the idea that the commander did it on purpose in order to annoy the prisoners. Like, look at what freaks are free to roam the streets nowadays. In the first video, I talked about the Cramps' famous show at Napa State Hospital. What I didn't realize is that this same film outfit, Target Video, recorded another punk show at a state institution that same year. In September 1978, the San Francisco band Crime performed at San Quentin Prison. And what I especially love about this story is that it's basically the exact opposite of the romantic prison concert tale. A band playing for downtrodden criminals out of a sense of duty or passion. Not so much. Instead, Crime's experience, much like auctions, shows how truly awkward a prison gig can be. The show was organized by a charity, and the band agreed to play, in part because there just weren't a whole lot of venues that would take punk bands at the time. A prison was also seemingly the perfect setting for a band that was known to wear matching cop uniforms on stage. But as the date drew closer, crime almost got cold feet. As drummer Hank Rank described, 
They said we couldn't wear blue jeans or a work shirt, cause in the event of a riot, they wouldn't want us to get shot, mistaken for prisoners. Then they told us about the no hostage rule, which is that if you're taken hostage by a prisoner, they will not bargain for your life. The no hostage policy is apparently a common theme for anybody who works at or visits a high security prison. Metallica would also get a rude awakening learning about this policy when they played the same prison in 2003. Now, contrary to the vision of an audience united by music, the band immediately noticed something funny. When a black group would play, all of the non-blacks would stand up and move to the far side of the yard. When a non-black group would play, the exact opposite would happen. I guess it should come as no surprise that concerts are no vacation from the segregation of everyday prison life. Crime took the stage after a country and western group, and they couldn't have been more out of place. It was a tough crowd, Rank described. They didn't exactly get the music, and the guards up on the tower with their guns looking down, shaking their heads. Nobody here knew what to make of us. It didn't help that singer Frankie Fix had been popping Valium all day, and nearly forgot which song to sing first. It was blazing heat, and they had a little speaker for a PA. And imagine, you're looking out there at a mass of 500 people, and all I could see were crimes written on their faces. Rape, murder, mutilation. All the disgusting side of humanity was sitting there looking at us. But if there was any silver lining, the band found out that Saran Saran, the man who assassinated Robert F. Kennedy, was being held in solitary confinement directly opposite the stage. And, as Rank told Amoeba Music years later, I'd like to think that our show was the worst punishment of his life. Maybe so. Maybe so. Last but not least, a few of you guys mentioned this famous incident from Queens of the Stone Age. In November 2007, Queens of the Stone Age planned to perform an intimate six-song concert at an unnamed rehab facility in Los Angeles. Not a prison, obviously, but since it's an inpatient institution, we'll let it slide. The band opened their show with Feel Good Hit of the Summer, which famously is just them listing off the names of drugs. But as reported by NME, the band never finished the song. The power was cut by angry staff members, and the band was even, quote, manhandled out of the building by heavy security. A few of you guys pointed this story out, and I quickly found it was something of a legend among fans. The thing is, I couldn't help but find the story a bit fishy. There's no photos or videos of them playing, and every article about it cited the NME article, which itself cited an unnamed spokesman for the band. Feel Good Hit of the Summer was one of the band's more popular singles, and it was released seven years earlier, so it seems likely that at least somebody on staff would have known about it. Not to mention, getting manhandled by security just for saying the names of drugs is kind of ridiculous. Especially in a rehab center where talking about drugs openly is, well, exactly what you're supposed to do. I was just about ready to call their bluff and chalk it all up as fiction used to promote their winter tour, conveniently mentioned at the bottom of the NME article. But then, I stumbled on this interview with SF Weekly, Josh Hami is about to open up about the rehab story when, mysteriously, it gets cut off. But, a quick trip to the internet archive, and we now finally have a first-hand account of the show. It was one of those fancy rehab centers where you could ride horses on the beach. Josh Hami's friend was a patient there, and he asked if the band would stop by to play some songs. They opened up with Feel Good Hit of the Summer because, Hami said, people can take it wherever they want. If you think it's negative and endorses drugs, then it's negative. 
but it could also be anti-drug, he explained. The nurse ratchet type figure running the facility, however, was not into it. She walked right onto the stage with her orderlies and shut it down. Put down those keys and nobody gets hurt. The words sue and legal action got thrown around. But it doesn't sound like the band was too worried. Even though the concert only lasted a few minutes, the crowd apparently loved it. The funny thing is, he's been to rehab three times, Hami said of his friend. I'm not bragging, but he did say this was his best time. That will probably close out this chapter on prison concerts for a while. But if there's any others I missed, or if you want to weigh in on any of these wild, perhaps improbable stories, drop a comment below. Also, be sure to check out part one if you haven't already.